Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Stephanie Toole, and I'm the Education and Outreach Manager at the Maslin Museum. I'm excited to welcome you to this artist panel with Finding Identity Heritage's Inspiration guest curator Tim Rai and artists Amy Lee, Chi Wong, and Jordan Wong. The exhibition is on view in the Maslin Museum's Fred F. Sook Community Room and Flex Galleries now through May 21st. We are pleased to offer this program in conjunction with the 2023 NEA Big Read in Maslin, through which we are celebrating Interior Chinatown by Charles Yu. NEA Big Read is a program of the National Endowment of the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest. For a complete listing of in-person and online Big Read events in Maslin, Stark County, and beyond, visit maslinmuseum.org slash bigread. Before we begin, I will share the Maslin Museum's land acknowledgement. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects the history and presence of Indigenous peoples and their enduring relationship to their traditional homeland since time immemorial. The Maslin Museum recognizes that this is the traditional homeland of the Lenape Delaware, Shawnee, Wyandotte, Miami, Ottawa, Seneca Cayuga, Chippewa, Potawatomi, and tribes now comprising the Peoria tribe. We acknowledge these peoples, their elders, past, present, and future, and the thousands of Native people who now call Northeast Ohio home. Museum staff will be monitoring the Facebook comments during this program, and there will be time for questions during the last 15 minutes or so. Please submit your questions in the chat. And now I will turn the program over to Finding Identity guest curator, Tim Arai. Hello. Uh... Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, my name is Tim Rai. Uh, a quick introduction about myself before we uh, move on to the main event with the three artists. Um, I uh, first got in contact with uh, Alex, the director of the Maslin Museum through uh, the board of the Cleveland Print Room. Um, I've always had a, an interest in the arts as well as uh, specifically in photography. And being on the board, uh, we were talking about this event, this NEA Big Read for 2023. And we were exchanging ideas and uh, came to the point where uh, I had the wonderful honor of uh, being the guest curator, as well as working with these three fantastic artists, uh, talking about heritage and talking about uh, being part of the Asian American community and the like. So without further ado, I would like to introduce um, the three artists uh, one at a time. Uh, and if they can come on and uh, give a brief uh, introduction of themselves, uh, that'll be great. So first off, uh, Amy Lee, uh, if you will, please. Hi, thanks, Tim. Thanks to the museum and everyone joining us tonight. Um, my name is Amy Lee. I'm a Korean American person, um, but I'm a papermaker and my expertise is in Korean papermaking and a lot of the different crafts and um, techniques that are related to that, along with the tool making um, history and the culture around that. So my goal for the last about 15 years has been to share that through my artwork, through teaching, through um, uh, writing, through really any means necessary. So and I'm really excited to be part of this with Jordan and Irina, thanks. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, next up, Chi Wang, hello. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Chi. I also go by the name of Irina. Thank you for joining us tonight. And I'm really excited to be here with Amy and Jordan and Tim and everyone else with the museum at Maslon Museum. Um, so uh, my background is that I am a Chinese American artist. Um, uh, I specialize in watercolor drawing and also public installation work. So I work with like various uh, nonprofit projects and uh, like murals and stuff like that. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Irina. Um, next up, Jordan, uh, if you can uh, give a brief introduction. Thank you very much. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Hi, everyone. Uh, again. It's like another round of, of thank yous, but we're uh, we're all excited for you all to, to join us. Um, my name is Jordan Wong. Um, I work under the name Wong Face. 
And uh, I actually started off uh, my creative career as a graphic designer, um, but have in the last two years kind of departed away from design uh, client work and uh, I'm now just focusing on the uh, personal art practice. Uh, my work is uh, rooted in, in drawing and, and I may mainly create digitally and have worked on several different public art projects throughout Cleveland, um, as well as opportunities to exhibit at um, you know, different museums, Children's Museum in Pittsburgh, Akron Art Museum, and now Maslin Museum. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so um, obviously the whole conversation today will be surrounding the artwork, but um, before I have specific questions uh, to the artists about the part, about particular artworks that are on display uh, at the museum, I also wanted to first kind of set uh, some tones um, and talk about some of the influences uh, that, that they had to get to uh, where they are. Um, so for, uh, we'll just go in order. Uh, for Amy, uh, I do have a question. Um, I know that in your bio, uh, a lot of this came about from being a, a Fulbright scholar to Korea, where you learned about all the paper making and, and, and a lot of that technique. Um, so first of all, for anyone who's joining this that doesn't know, if you can uh, explain a little bit more about the differences with Korean paper making. Um, and, and how that came about, and then how you're able to take that material uh, and what kind of influences came through that material to, to help you create all the beautiful work that are up in the museum today. Um, so Korean paper make, I mean, every uh, culture that has paper making has its own specific um, kind of unique qualities about it. And, um, with Korean paper making, one of the most unique parts is that in the old uh, sheet formation method, meaning when you're actually at the vat forming the sheets of paper on a bamboo screen, that uh, the screen sits on top of a wooden frame that's suspended from a crossbar over the vat, and there's no additional frame on top of the screen. So there's no additional decal. I know this is a totally like doesn't make sense to people who aren't paper makers, but essentially, it's a process that the whole vat becomes kind of your partner in the process rather than just kind of scooping up what you need um, of the pulp and then like manipulating what's in there with the frame. And so that, that determines, and that and the suspension of the screen determines a lot of the other kinds of things that go around it technically, which um, also requires it to be a two ply sheet and two layers. So it's um, even if it, the sheet is very thin, it can also be very, very strong. So um, that might be a little technical, but um, in terms of my influences, uh, a lot of the research I was doing was into the history and then just artifacts. And so I love going to museums and not only just seeing what's on display. And in Korea, there's obviously more Korean work on display, but when I'm back home in the States, the, usually when you go to museums, the Korean section is like this small. So you just kind of like walk out of the Chinese section and there's like this much Korean work. And so it's very quick, easy to see it quickly, but um, you, uh, you just learn after a while, like the things that really strike you. And then I also have cultivated relationships with conservators and curators um, who help me actually go through the museum storage, so different kinds of databases, um, like the Museum American Museum of Natural History in New York, um, or even the Cleveland Museum of Art, where I can actually access objects from Korea that almost never go on display, partly because they don't know enough about about it to be able to actually have it be kind of meaningful. So um, in that way, I'm able to see a lot of paper objects. But so that's that's um, kind of the direct artifacts that are made by usually hands that we don't know the names um, from, but of. But um, and then just trying to always take the contemporary twist on it. Like how how do I remake things that would resonate with people now? Um, so and then also it's it's entirely based on the materials and process. So what kind of uh, plants that I have access to here that I can harvest in a way that's sustainable and 
um, what kind of colors that I can derive from plants. So there's a lot of different things, but those are kind of some of the main themes for me. Awesome, thank you. Um, along the same vein uh, with Chi, um, I know there's quite a bit of uh, influence uh, in your work, in your uh, very intricate uh, watercolor work from you know, places that you've lived, places that you've grown up, uh, places that you've visited. Um, I know you mentioned in your bio, uh, Chinatown and, and such, but if you can, um, and you, it, also in your work, there's a lot of um, very small details and it's almost like fantastical, whimsical. Um, so if you can talk a little bit about the influences overall, as well as, you know, where these little little creatures that are in all your artwork, you know, where they come from and, and it almost seems like there's a a a Chi Wong universe, you know that that that's kind of that that kind of lives throughout all of your work. If you can uh, talk a little bit about that as well before we uh, start actually looking at the artwork. Yes, thank you, Tim. Oh uh, yeah. So to start off, um, since my inspiration for my artwork, it is very much based around the Chinese culture, specifically Manhattan, Chinatown, where I um, was born, but I also visited during the summertime of like uh, my school days. And I reside, I grew up in Ohio, like in suburbia, Ohio, where it's mostly predominantly like white uh, community. And so me visiting like Chinatown and um, in New York, city Manhattan it felt a little bit more closer to home and so when I visit Manhattan you'll notice like in the Asian Chinese community everything is very dense and very packed there's also a lot of details um, a lot of like buildings a lot of like wires a lot of everything just crunched together in one area and that is that is what feels a little bit more familiar to my Asian heritage um, where also similar in my Chinese home, there's a lot of clutter. Uh, that's the, probably the best way to describe these, uh, this kind of environment where there's a lot of clutter, there's a lot of like uh, objects um, and things all around. And that reflects directly translate into my drawings where everything, there's so many like actions happening one right next to each other and whether it be like in the, a building or like the characters. So like there might be a character eating and there might be a character like spilling tea from somewhere. There's always like a sense of motion going on into my drawings. And that's what I really like to rec um, recreate in this little imaginary world of mine that I am, I have, I am drawing and also painting. And so in regards to like the characters, um, some of these characters are all made up, but also so they have some um, they have some references in my life. Like for some of them, they are food characters. Some of these characters are food, which are like food food that I like to eat. But there's also like characters, like an Asian grandpa that I would put that I have like recreated that or that is like familiar to me, like my family member or like someone in the community or something like that. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, and then uh, finally, Jordan. Um, so I know, um, you know, there's been a lot of your work all throughout Cleveland as well. And it's pretty recognizable that a lot of it comes from uh, the anime, manga, video game world. And you mentioned that in your statements and your bios as well that we have that, that are available uh, publicly. Um, if you can uh, go into a little more detail about how those influences and those characters, uh, how you take those influences and kind of put them together for a, a, a cohesive message that you want to um, show through your work. Um, I'm not even sure if it's cohesive. Well, <laughs> even if it's not cohesive. <laughs> that's, that's very maybe maybe, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe uh, an overall theme, but yeah, maybe not specifically absolutely. one cohesion. There's, there's definitely uh, some common threads, you know, throughout what I do, of, of course. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this uh, because I started drawing when I was four years old. And at that age, I was just in love with, you know, those things that you mentioned, the anime, the manga, especially my father was bringing back things 
um, from Japan where he would do business and I would have things that, you know, these, these toys and, and, you know, these little figurines that no one in, in, um, my school had and is even the box art on, on, um, the toy, um, robot model kits, uh, just blew me away whenever I was young. Um, but I've been thinking a lot lately, why, why was I drawn to these things and, and like, why was I so in, in love with it? And, and, um, you know, why, why wasn't it something else? And, you know, whenever you're an adult trying to psychoanalyze your young kid self, you, you're just trying to kind of fill in the blanks. And I realized, um, you know, very much growing up, kind of similar to what Irina just mentioned, um, I lived in a, in a neighborhood in a town where no one looked like me. Um, I graduated from a high school of over 600 kids and there were maybe four uh, Asian American students. And I was the only Chinese um, uh, American student. But, you know, while I'm in school or even out in the neighborhood playing with, with you know, the kids that lived around me and feeling kind of like the other. Um, so feeling, you know, not whatever it means to be American or, or like everyone else, I would also struggle with finding um, belonging or, or, or deep sense of connection, even with my family, because I don't speak um, the language. I don't speak uh, Mandarin um, or Cantonese, more so on my father's side. So I would go to family um, dinners or even just like the grocery store surrounded by people that look like me and still not feel um, completely uh, uh, belonged or, 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 or connected um, in, a, in a way that others might have if you know, they actually speak the language. Uh, so existing in this, in this third space kind of allowed me to just attached to the things that I just simply enjoyed, simply the things that, that fascinated me. Um, and I kind of cultivated uh, who I was, you know, as a kid to now being, you know, much older and, and an artist, uh, purely through the, the things that I enjoy. Um, and, you know, back then, it was all about the stories and, and the characters and, and expressing that fascination through trying to recreate those characters. And now, you know, it's fun to use those imagery, those motifs, that aesthetic as vehicles to kind of share things that I'm exploring um, in life now. And it's funny because the things that, you know, we dream of as, as a kid you know, this idea of overcoming, you know, like a, a big monster or, or, you know, beating some boss or, or defeating some villain. Um, the, the story of being a protagonist, I think it still very much carries on as, as we, we grow older. Um, but the, the villains are, are just different, right? Um, and then there's like this next level of, I don't know, epiphany or realization um, that you realize there there are no you know um, antagonists and and really it's 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 more about uh, overcoming yourself you know um, and and getting over or maybe navigating through um, the things that that hold you back that actually come from within you and this is all hidden uh, beneath you know, not just the the recognizable, you know, references that I'm drawing, but also some of these icons that I'm constructing uh, throughout the work as well. That's great. Uh, thank you. Um, oh, yeah. I also realized uh, in my intro, um, I am a Japanese American. Uh, and I do uh, understand what Jordan was saying, too, because uh, I was, I think we were the only non-white family in the entire town uh, when I was growing up uh, outside of Buffalo. So uh, yeah, I definitely understand. Uh, so with that introduction, uh, I wanted to uh, at least give the artist some uh, 
uh, an ability to to uh, to explain some of the work that that's up um and you know do the time and they have some great works up at the museum so uh, if you guys haven't seen it yet you should definitely see it uh across two different galleries um i kind of chose some work for each of you three um that i wanted to know more information on personally kind of in a selfish way uh if you want to talk about anything else that was also up um on display please let me know uh but uh i'm going to try to share my screen and let's see here here we go great okay no screen share is loading hey all right so first up is amy um, so I know uh, you were talking about um, during your intro about heritage, but also um, how you are using local ingredient, ingredients, local plants, sustainability, all of that to make these beautiful pieces that you have up in the museum. And uh, one of the ones that is like the big main piece up on the second floor is titled Eternal. Let me see if I can bring that up. There it is. Um, this picture alone doesn't do it justice. It's a full-sized uh, dress uh, up on the wall, uh, made entirely out of hanji. Um, but I, I, I like the concept of this traditional dress um, put together uh, from your papermaking technique. Uh, but if you could um, kind of talk us through uh, the, your, your thought process, um talk us through this piece right here uh how it kind of came together um i think these are all like the bottom half is just one giant sheet of paper i believe and and so on uh so if you can give us some insights into this piece uh that will be fantastic sure thanks the the skirt actually is um three it should be three different panels that are sewn together so I started making garments out of paper and specifically out of hanji. So hanji is Korean paper. Han means Korean, chi means paper. So hanji, that word encompasses all you need to say. So if you say hanji, it just means Korean paper. Don't say, don't say hanji paper, that's incorrect and redundant. Um, so I was starting to make the garments maybe in 2012 on a residency in Santa Fe when I I was sewing bits of hanji on top of hanji and it was in response to actually seeing very old artifacts from a nomadic culture in Kyrgyzstan from a show at the NYU um, Center for Ancient Studies and being really taken by this idea that there they had no idea what these artifacts actually were were and i really appreciated that the curators said that in the in the tags and and um some many things most things to humans will will remain a mystery whether it's human behavior or nature or things that uh happen outside of us but i started making these pieces and then it felt like just a piece of paper as a base sheet was not enough and so I started sewing um, these pieces onto dresses and that's when I started to understand that uh, it making garments is really difficult and it's not just uh, like the form of the flat form doubled sewed together uh, it's actually it's an incredible feat of engineering where you're taking 2D and creating three dimensions because it has to drape around a body um, so I started doing that and then I didn't, and then I stopped for a while, but then I started back up. I can't exactly even remember why or how, but it happened after I moved to Cleveland from New York and had more access to the Hanji studio I built here. And I just, I just started making more. And I think part of it was also out of just a desire to be able to practice uh, making garments but also always to push the the limits of the paper to see what it could do and oh now I, th I think I remember now it was because I after the first the first Fulbright I went on another research trip to Korea on a different grant and the teacher who had taught me chumchi which is a method of texturing hanji she had wanted me to make garments out of it because that's what she did and there was a history of that 
but she had such um, bad dementia that she didn't really remember. She didn't remember me or anything, but I found the paper I had, had worked on with her. And as a tribute to her to kind of finish out what she wanted of me, I constructed a garment and then I just, there were scraps. So then I made from an adult size, a child size, and then from there, a doll size. And then it just, and then I just went off and just kept making them. But at a certain point, I was using a lot of Western dress patterns, or I shouldn't say West, American dress patterns. And, and I realized I really should actually focus on um, trying to work with Korean dress. So this is a very basic version of a hanbok, which is Korean clothing. Uh, for the woman. So the top is a jacket and then a short jacket. And then the bottom of it is a skirt. So it's a two piece. And then it has this kind of signature uh, tie in the front. So the choguri, which is the top, is using paper that's dyed with uh, or technically coated with persimmon juice, which is a very traditional Korean color and uh, technique and material that they would use actually on real clothes for for working essentially because it wicks away sweat and repels water and repels insects and then the the skirt the chima is actually uh it's the the pulp was pigmented blue before I actually formed the sheets and then afterwards I sprayed on more of the persimmon so it's kind of a, more of an uneven uh application but um that's where you get you know you, it's almost like it's blushing in certain parts and more blue in other parts which is hard to see in the image and then um but every single piece is made out of hanji so really it was it's part of almost like a, a study like just just an ongoing study and being able to see what i can do with with paper and garments and right now what I'm pushing it further where I'm now taking the bark that makes the paper and manipulating it into kind of lace or grids that are reminiscent of different kinds of bark substrates that were going on all over the world specifically the ones that I have looked into the most um, are from Polynesia and from West Africa to the Caribbean through slavery and so, um, and then take, so taking that bark and inking it or pressure printing and then printing that onto the paper and then creating the garment so that the imagery comes from the same plant that makes the paper. So um, there's always, and, and with this one, it was really just a test of seeing how big I could go. Cause this is really, this is quite, quite large um, in terms of for, for paper making, it's a lot of work. So yeah, that's it. Well, hold on. Stop share for a second. Okay, there we go. Hi, sorry about that. Thank you, Amy. Um, yes, uh, I mean that dress is is beautiful. I mean it, it is almost like a full size dress. It's it's amazing. Um, thank you for going into detail. Uh, I do like that. The, the bark uh, concept, I think, you know, that'll be cool to see. Um, it's, it's, it sounds amazing. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so next up for Chi, um, I was looking at, uh, uh oh where did it go? Where did it go? The, the griddle alarm. Uh, here we go. Let me bring that up. Share screen again. Here we go. Hey, there it is. So um, I think this kind of represents a lot of what you talked about earlier with your influences. There, I mean, a lot, a lot of your uh, paintings that are on display kind of fit that mold, but I do like this a lot, uh, especially the way it's kind of in a fisheye as well that kind of draws you in. Uh, but if you, I know you mentioned that there's a lot of personal influences in here, as well as a lot of uh, what you, you kind of lived through and what you've seen. Um, so if you can kind of go into a little bit of detail, maybe there's some hidden stuff in here as well that you might want us to kind of see, kind of think about, um, that would be great. Yes, yes thank you. So this, uh, this piece, it is called Griddle Alarm. And I just want to give a little background about like this uh, art piece and, and my art making. 
So whenever I start a drawing, I give myself a prompt. And usually these prompts are what if and why not questions. And um, usually these prompts uh, are really funny and ridiculous questions. Like for example, when I am, when I was uh, drawing this piece, I asked myself, what if clocks were pancake makers? And so meaning like these clocks, like the front of it would like flap out like a waffle maker or a pancake maker. And then you just pour your pancake batter and then uh, close it up and it'll just make pancakes. And so that's the, um, uh, like the subject of this painting. And so the reason why I would create these prompts for my paintings is because um, growing up in a Chinese culture, I am, there are things that I am uh, considered normal uh, in my Chinese culture, but it will be, it might be quite absurd to like a person that is not, not Asian and that is uh, quite weird. For example, like the most common uh, example would be like wearing, like taking off your shoes um, when you enter a Asian home, whether it be like Korean or Japanese or Chinese. So like whenever, when, when I was growing up in a um, suburban neighborhood that was predominantly white and I would like visit my friends, they would walk into their house with the shoes and I, that was a culture shock. And so because of this culture shock, I am create, uh, that kind of like transfers into like my paintings because oh, what I mean by that is because in this world, this like fantasy world I created, making pancakes out of these clock, these uh these um griddle, like clock griddles, is very normal to the characters in there, but it's very like weird and why to us viewers that are staring into my drawing. And so that's um that's like a little bit about like how I make my artwork and like the message I, that I like that I revolve around my artwork and so like like going into little like details of my paintings um one thing that I mentioned is that it's like like my experience from Chinatown and Manhattan is that everything is like so bustling and busy and that's what you see right here and not only that if you look at the um left hand side of the painting there's like rows and rows of pancake makers that are that have their own like designated like little kitchen and they're like mass producing these pancakes and they're just like there's so many actions over there but there's also so many actions in the right hand corner um where there's like characters eating their pancakes and also there's like a character that is like sunbathing, quote unquote, sunbathing on top of those pancakes and just like these continuous little details that keep on happening all in all. So yeah, I hope that answers some questions. It does, it does, thank you. Um, I, I like that idea of us being like, a, not, not a voyeur per se, but you know, looking into this different culture as opposed to this kind of fantastical chaotic world there's mm -hmm. actually reasons and order in this which you know like you were saying uh i think all of us uh you know me and the, all, all the other artists have also experienced the, the culture shock or the differences just so even some of them subtle some of them not so much between the different mm -hmm. cultures and uh and, and i do like that that idea that this is another different culture that um that we get to try to figure out so uh, yeah, thank you for that. And then uh, Jordan. So uh, in your case, picking uh, the piece was fairly easy since uh, there's one giant piece up on the second floor um, that uh, is titled Manga. Let me see if I can bring that up successfully. There it is. Uh, so no, 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 hit the wrong button. Hold on, please. <laughs> there we go, there we go, there we go. Uh, so for people viewing this, this at home, um, this is a very large piece. So you can actually go up and see all of the details. So seeing this on your screen, especially if you're looking at this on the phone, 
doesn't do it justice. Definitely worth seeing it uh, live. With that being said, there is a lot of detail in here. Um, and I know when you were talking about your influences, you know, uh, there were a lot of um, uh, thought behind what the details mean and, and some of the icons and stuff that are thrown in there. Um, obviously, you don't need to go through it panel by panel, <laughs> but <laughs> if you can kind of give the overall idea, the overall flow, and um, I, I, I feel like this kind of hits a lot of the points that you talked about in one big piece. So uh, if you can uh, give uh, 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 some, some explanation to the piece, uh, that would be great. Yeah. Um, I've had people ask me before, like, oh, what, what direction, you know, should I kind of, you know, view this in? Where do I start? Where's the ending? Um, and there, you know, there actually is kind of um, a somewhat natural um, directional, you know, for the, for the narrative, even though it's, it's not entirely clear cut. Um, I've had like in creating it, how it was actually created, like as far as me starting and finishing the work, it was very much uh, left to right, but I didn't want to have it be too sequential um, in that each panel uh, really presents um, kind of its, its own moments. And overall it, it, it connects thematically. Um, but there, there, there are moments that you can experience either with the one panel or you know a cluster of of three. Um, so as as far as like you know where do I begin? It's like kind of like wherever you would like to um, when when um, you know visiting and 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 seeing the piece in person. Um, the the title of of the work is is very much like uh, obvious um especially in in you know what ins inspires me you know as an artist what got me into art and drawing as as a kid and and I very wanted I very much wanted that to be kind of like uh prominent and also like I mentioned pretty obvious as far as aesthetically you know how things are drawn and 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 you know what it, what it's referencing stylistically absolutely connected um to you know that which i was just enamored with as a kid um i think that the the drawing in, in, in manga is just absolutely breathtaking like as an art form right um comic books in in general or, or graphic novels um i think it's changing but in the past i feel like it, it was easy to dismiss it or kind of um separate it from fine art um or or other uh categories of of, of drawing um but you know the the, the japanese manga is it's like it's truly remarkable um and this this work really i think am, like ambitiously tried to capture you know um that level of detail, you know, uh, that level of, of, of drawing um, that just blew me away as a kid and that I'm attempting later in life uh, as an artist. Um, but, but mixed with um, things that are stylistically um, personal and, and um, what I would believe to be uniquely myself, um, again, lots of iconography. Um, there's some abstract elements. I love playing with directionals like arrows, as well as um, just uh, recognizable symbols like plus signs, minus signs, multiplication signs, um, you know, the pause icon, play icons, um, as well as sprinkling in um, some Chinese characters um, throughout the work as well. Um, when people ask me like, oh, what's, what's this whole piece about? I am always debating on whether, how much I want to share and, and, you know, versus kind of providing more room for discovery or interpretation, um, for, for viewers. I will say this though, that, um, 
the the whole work itself is 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 a metaphor for um you know being a kid and facing bigotry and and the challenges of of being you know considered other and the insecurities and and um you know uh you know pain that that comes from that and and how you know as a kid uh, how you would imagine a kid copes with with those complex emotions and maybe venturing into these imaginative um realms or or or, or visuals um i don't know if that's saying too much cuz now it you know as you go through it and you kind of look at it with with that consideration um it may connect a lot more things which maybe good maybe bad um but this definitely uh was uh, an ambitious piece um at the time it was actually first exhibited um uh, in the akron art museum actually out like outside in their their garden space uh but this iteration at maslin is actually a little bit different uh than the one that was on view uh in akron um i don't want to give away what i changed or what i added but it it is a, a little bit different um yeah this this one's uh uh it's it's a personal piece uh but at the same time it is it is one that um I had a lot of fun with and and really enjoyed creating yeah that's uh that's awesome um and yes you're right uh what manga uh are this that's usually it's just one guy can do in such a short amount of time uh, with all the detail it's it's simply incredible and and I, I like how you use that to show a lot of um, motion emotion all that like it, it just um, there's a lot of power in each of the each of the frames and and uh, I think it's fantastic um we actually have uh, some questions uh, from the audience I'm gonna quickly stop sharing this uh before we move on um okay so let me get to those questions as well so that um because we are almost at 15 minutes uh so uh first question um is for amy uh amy the question is how does hanji compare to other types of paper and uh question number two related do you have to start your work over if the paper tears while you're working? Uh, well, there are so many different kinds of paper, so it's really hard to say. Plus, there are so many different kinds of hanji. Hanji doesn't mean, it doesn't, it, it's not talking about one specific type of paper. It, since it just means Korean paper, there the jury's out in terms of what that even encompasses. Like, does it encompass paper? that's made in Korea, but by machine. Um, there are certain people in Korea who think it should be only reserved as a term for very traditional paper made in the traditional Korean way by Koreans in Korea. So that would mean what I'm making here in America would not qualify as hanji. So one, I mean, there are different hallmarks. I'll, I'll give it two examples. So you could get really heavyweight uh, maybe four ply, four layers, and then oiled with uh, different kinds of like different beans that are ground and then rubbed through a bag many, many times onto the surface of the paper by hand to create giant sheets that are used then as flooring paper. And that would be different from other papers that are, let's say, smaller or more lightweight or um, are not oiled. Um, and then there's there's very fine lightweight hanji that can be used to treat old artifacts and have and 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 it has been certified. One of my more recent teachers, Shin Hyunse, uh, who is a national treasure of hanji making, he his hanji was certified by the Italian government to actually treat and fix their their national treasures as in their objects and artifacts 
And so those are, that's paper that's very, very lightweight, very fine, really translucent. A lot of light showing, comes through, but because the fibers of the plant that makes it uh, are, are so strong, the paper is very strong, so it can be used to patch and then kind of disappear almost in a way. So it's, it's, and then I also have to say here, especially because this is a panel on Asian American things, and um, it would be similar to what people think of as rice paper, but I would really encourage people never to use that term when you're talking about that kind of generic white paper that you get, that's usually made out of paper mulberry bark because it's actually a racist and derogatory term. And most people don't know that so that they just say it all the time. Um, they, I, I even have been, you know, when I was reading Michelle Obama's um, Becoming, was tempted to contact the publisher and say, please take that out of the book, um, but I didn't have time to do it. So it was, it was essentially coined by Europeans, white Europeans who didn't, we were kind of conflating rice farming and different things that they saw in different parts of Asia that were foreign to them, conflating that with the whiteness of paper. Rice doesn't make paper, at least the part you eat does not make paper. Things that you can eat don't make paper because paper has to be made out of cellulose. So, and people can't digest cellulose. So, um, but in general, that kind of lightweight, uh, flexible paper made with long fibered plants, um, Hanji falls into that category. And then in terms of tearing, I don't, it depends how bad the tear is. I usually don't have to start over because again, I, like I was saying with, using hanji to treat objects, you can use hanji to treat itself. So I can repair tears pretty easily with more paper um, or with sewing. So um, there's a lot, I mean, this is why I love sewing with hanji because it's actually in some ways more, not as forgiving as fabric, but then very forgiving in other ways. There are ways that you can cheat that you can't cheat with fabric. Like I can just glue things that I have a hard time sewing and you can't you can't do that when you're making dresses out of fabric that are meant to be worn. Whereas my dresses are meant, even if they're, they would fit onto a human body, they're meant just to be artwork to, to hang. So yeah, that's it, thanks. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you about the, the, the rice paper thing. Um, even for me, you know, it always sounded weird. I didn't know where it came from literally until now. So thank you. Um, you know, even in Japan, we have washi, which is, you know, it's kind of similar in a way, you know, it's our traditional paper, but I remember growing up, everyone just generically just called washi rice paper. So uh, yeah, good to know. Uh, next question um, is for Chi. So um, Chi, the question is, um, you refer to figures in your paintings as quote unquote characters. Uh, does she make up distinct personalities for these figures that build off the prompts that she that you use to create your work? Um, so just to like clarify the question, you said, do the characters each have their personalities or does yes. it just go, okay. So um, yes. it says, does she make up distinct personalities for the figures uh, that you call characters, um, and which then builds off the prompts that you use to create your work. Yes, yes. So each character, they have their own very distinct um, personalities, personality types, and then they are uh, these. Each of these characters are part of this world, so they're interacting with these of uh, the world that I am like building for each uh, painting because each painting it it just shows like a. Each painting shows like a specific area, whether it be like a store or like somewhere outdoors, and it has like a uh, each have their own prompts, and these characters are interacting with um, with these uh, the area that I created. And so, like going back to like like if anyone is looking at Griddle Alarm, like there's this one character that has like a scuba helmet. Um, um, it's like sits right in front. It's the very first character that you'll see and has a scuba helmet. And that character is usually very silent. It's very like, but it's, a, it's pretty much like a child that's still exploring the world around it while there's another character that has like, um, that has like two, uh, like two characters away from it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Tim, do you think you can point 
with your mouse. Hold on, please. <laughs> Technology is fun. Okay, here we go. Uh, yeah, which yeah. character? So in the very first one, um, there's right next on the left hand side, um, there's a character that's in yellow and has a scuba helmet. Like, yeah, 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 right there, right there. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. So his um, he he has a scuba helmet and. His is very like quiet. His personality is pretty much quiet, but he's also I consider him as a child, like your inner child as a little shy. And but he's also like like um what do you call it? Very like childlike that's very energetic and does whatever like like expressive. He's very expressive with his arm language. Like that's why he has like a fork, uh, sorry, a knife like up in the air right there. And if you like see, like if anyone has like scrolled through any of the other paintings, the, each of these characters are always reoccurring. They're always coming back and you'll see them. And then there's like another character that is on the right hand side and it's a blue character. It's a blue like, yeah, right there. Yes, yes, yes. So for him, he is a HVAC robot that I like to call him. I have some robot characters that are based off of like home appliances and he's an HVAC or like a fan that can do like AC or heating system. And um, he is more like the parent. So like he's like, he's like a toying or like he's, and, and one like when in that drawing, he's holding on to, another robot's like radar, like the antenna, because he's trying to like, uh, like tone him down and calm him down. He's basically like a parent. I, I put him as like a parent, like personality where he's like looking after his fellow childs or something like that. That makes sense. It does, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it kind of gives the, the world even more depth. Uh, knowing all of this but at the same time I think you know even if you don't you can kind of project a lot of your feelings towards them and and even the subtle movements and the poses kind of help mm -hmm. define each of the characters too so uh thank you yes thank you and then uh Jordan uh we have another question uh so this is a little more specific uh, do you reference manga? Does Jordan reference manga specifically, or does he also take inspiration from anime and other animation, I suppose, outside of the anime world? Um, so what other places, I think more in general, what other places are you getting your influences um, for your artwork? Sure, sure. Um, I think... Uh... Stylistically, there's a lot that you can connect to, you know, the manga and ev even the animes, especially since they have like such a close relationship. Uh, but as far as like referencing or being inspired by other forms of um, animation, absolutely. Um, I'm a big fan of like Adventure Time, um, regular show, some, you know, other uh, American uh animations and, and cartoons um and it's interesting to see some of that stuff also reference you know the the things that um were coming out in japan i feel that anime and manga is no longer just confined uh to you know this you know beginning in in in, in japan and, and japanese culture but has now kind of become like this global thing um i remember seeing a an artist who's based um somewhere in in south america um and they were they were producing these these prints and these uh, these drawings that it looked like someone from tokyo was, were were you know creating um so it's interesting how this this stuff like evolves how it, it kind of disseminates and, and inspires other art forms, other, other um, you know, uh, media and, and stories. Um, and I would say, like, as far as, like, the question of, like, do I reference 
things outside of anime but are still considered animation um i would say yes maybe in in the term in like maybe the the i don't want to say maybe the effect of of some of these wildly imaginative um experiences that these other shows are are bringing right um there's something kind of weird and and quirky and whimsical about adventure time um that i loved when i first watched it and 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 um there are moments of weirdness and 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 humor uh in in my work and there are things that i draw that make me giggle um and and I hope that others can find them as well. Um, but in addition to all those things, um, you know, in regards to like the influence and the inspiration, I pull a lot from uh, uh, design that I see just out in the world, especially coming from um, a background design, uh, a profession of, of graphic design um, when I first started working for myself. So I love simplified um effective forms um you know things like logos or icons um things that just have such a, a an immediate communication and it's fun to take something that is visually um like i said immediate but then have it be ambiguous so almost like using these forms that you would see in graphic design which is supposed to be for communication and it's supposed to be direct and and you know um provide clarity but then flip it on its head and have it represent something a little bit more ambiguous something a little bit more ethereal um and and nuanced um so there's like I, like I said, there's a lot of influence, you know, in, in, in that respect, a lot of moments that you can find in my work where I'm, I'm playing with that. Um, and there's also um, many moments connected to like design um, that are inspired by the packaging um, of things that I grew up with, you know, um, but now am kind of having a, a, a deeper um, appreci appreciation for um going to grocery stores you know not only am i excited because you know to to buy like the different types of foods and, and things like that um but just seeing all the, the asian food packaging is it's it's like a um yeah it's it's like a visual wonderland um and noticing the the commonalities through all that and then kind of referencing that through the work um as well as just things that I see day to day, like walking down the street. I love traffic signs. <laughs> like I love street signs and, um, you know, little icons on weird things like hand dryers or escalators. Um, you know, all, all those, those graphical moments um, are, are always delighting me. Um, and, and, it's, it's very much evident uh, whenever you look at the work and you can find them. Yeah, influences everywhere. Um, that's fantastic. So um, we are running out of time, but I did want to kind of, sorry, Stephanie. Uh, I'm going to do this one last thing. This is going to be, it's a big question, but we got to kind of run it through. So um, sorry about that, but I did want to ask. Um, and this will be the last question for the artists as well. So first of all, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, the question is, is there any advice you'd give to other artists who would like to reference issues of culture, society, identity in their work? Like I said, it's a big question, um, but um, maybe if you could distill it down to say like one advice that you would give someone who wants to, um, to to reference these 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 concepts in their artwork uh amy i know it's a big question <laughs> well i think first it has to really come from an authentic place where this is really important to you and not from a place where you feel like you have to because i think uh, so much of the issues for um artists who are in the margins or 
you know, from minority groups is that we are often almost only allowed to talk about those things and not allowed to just kind of make art about what we want. And, and then it becomes almost like this rehashing of trauma or um, working through it. And because it's the only thing that we're kind of valued for, like, that's what they want to see. It's like dancing monkey in that sense. So first make sure that it's really something that you want to do and not something that you're trying to do out of a sense of like, this is going to get me somewhere, you know, like, like that, make sure there's no weird ulterior motive. Um, I mean, and also sometimes you won't know, maybe there isn't a bad motive and you won't know until years later, but um, I think just be really be true to, so be true to the motivation. And then just, I would say, really do your research. Uh, I've been, I've been devoted to this for, for like 15 years and gone back and forth to Korea. And I, I keep reading, I, I learn things, new things all the time. I just finished reading um, travel diaries of one of the first white American dudes who was in Korea before like everything really went bad um, in 1884 or the, and, and just really say, stay steeped in, in the, in the inspiration and the material and, um, just, yeah, just stay humble and really try to make yourself, make yourself a vessel for, for the inspiration rather than, um, kind of putting yourself, yeah, like put it, it just try to get over your ego, I guess, um, which often actually, Asian American artists have problems with their ego. So maybe you should really actually pump up your ego. So, um, but yeah, I think just, I want, I think it's for it to come from an authentic place and then a really, really um, to have a good foundation for it. Uh, uh, we can't, we can't as, as artists of color get away with um, just like half-assing anything. Thank you. Um, yeah, I do like that. How we sometimes get pigeonholed into a specific thing when in fact we are allowed to do anything but yes um uh, some great insight uh chi would you have uh some thoughts into this as well um i have uh some thoughts and i do want to bounce off of what amy has said where you like your culture should come from like your uh, cultural references should come from like an authentic uh place and like uh experiences of what you probably have experience and might just translate into your artwork like for example like in a very um simple explanation like I live with my grandparents and so and because I draw characters I sometimes draw characters that reflect some of their um behaviors like for example the iconic um hands behind her back when they're like walking or just yeah, just walking and strolling. Some of my characters do do that. And that's like a very little like cultural reference that um, gets put into my drawing. Or like, for example, the famous Asian squat where some characters of mine are, are doing the Asian squat. And that's like very much related to um, the culture, um, like, my, like the Asian culture, whether it be like Chinese, Korean or Japanese, we all have that like a uh, signature Asian squat and so um, I think for like these examples I uh, I provide it's like not it's probably not so like um, I don't know like not like a it's, it's like very little specific details um, and not maybe like not like not probably not addressing like a bigger issue um, since my work doesn't really address bigger issues, I like to, uh, I like to play around with like, um, culture, some like fun cultural behaviors that I see every day in my life since I live with my grandparents and my family still. And yeah, I hope that kind of answers a little bit, a little part of it. I think so too. Um, thank you for that. Also, I can't do the Asian squat and I, I, I feel bad every time I can't. But anyway, <laughs> and, uh, Jordan, uh, take it I away. can't do it either. <laughs> I can't do it either. Um, do you mind, do you mind repeating the question? <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, uh, yes. 
Is there any advice you would give to other artists who would like to reference issues of cultural, society, societal identity, et cetera, in their work? It's so funny. When you said this would be the last question, I thought I'd be like, what's everyone's favorite food? Man, you know, we got that, <laughs> we got, we got that in big and we're ending it with you. So, you know, let's so, not make this like a two hour lecture. Um, <laughs> Um, my, my initial, uh, like response in my head is like, oh, geez, I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I do, I do like what Amy and, and Irina, um, said earlier about it, um, coming from a sincere place, a, a, a place, you know, um, uh, yeah, that, that is authentic, right? um which you can you can tell as 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 the person <laughs> creating these things devoting time um and and money in into to sharing uh these things um you know it's it's tricky it's tricky especially since there's a lot of different ideas opinions perspectives on on um who can reference what? And um, yeah, it's it's difficult to navigate. I will I will I will say that it, it is absolutely difficult to navigate. Even thinking of my own work, like I don't know, I'm not Japanese. Is it okay for me to pull from manga and anime? I grew up watching it, you know, and I still watch it. I love it, um, but I'm not Japanese. Um, is, that, is that okay? And I don't, some people may say no, some people may say yes. Um, but I, I think, you know, what, whatever you do, and, and it's really in anything, it's, it's just um, connecting to, you know, the, the why, you know, why are you, why are you referencing this? Why are you fascinated by this thing? Um, the more you, you dive into that and the more that that fuels the study of it, the appreciation of it, um, even the consumption of it, um, the investment of it, um, you'll have a, a more nuanced and, and deeper connection, which allows you to actually create more sophisticated references and, and share, um, you know, deeper ideas or 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 emotions that are going to resonate um you know a lot stronger than just surface level um you know dabblings or um i don't know some may, some people may even like say like like skimping off the top um so yeah kind of echo, echoing amy um yeah go deep go deep especially if if it's like something that you love um, but, uh, I would, you know, the last piece of advice, like kind of connected to all of that is, um, you know, to, to be upfront, be upfront about, about, you know, what it is that inspires you, you know, what, where are, are these things coming from the references? Um, it's hard to criticize someone, you know, whenever they're at least being honest, um, about the things that they like you know purely or or, or fas fascinated by yeah i guess um kind of summarizing it it's it's you, you you need to have that that thought you need to have your ideas very uh, a very concrete idea you know something that you, you can't just go in and and just have this fluffy notion and and, and create the art and hope that it it, it kind of gives that influence or hope that it has that impact it, it, it needs to have a voice and um, yeah, all three of you were saying that too. You know, you, you got to know what you're getting yourself, and you got to have that voice first before you can uh, start creating the artwork. Or you can create the artwork, but you know, understand that you need that voice. So I think that's uh, that's great. Um, so yeah, we are well over time. Uh, sorry about that, but thank you uh, to all the artists. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, getting to work with all three of you. Uh, like I said earlier, if any of you watching uh, haven't seen the exhibit, it's up until the end of the month, and uh, it is fantastic and uh, definitely should be seen in person. 
uh, so you can see all the details and and all the characters and and everything up close. Uh, so uh, yeah, Stephanie. Um, I guess that's it for us. Yes, thank you, Tim, and thank you, Amy and Chi and Jordan. This has been a wonderful program. Thank you to all of our viewers. We will be sharing a recording of the program to our YouTube channel as well. Um, we hope you're able to enjoy some remaining programs to the end of the month. And like Tim said, please visit the museum and see this exhibit in person. It's up through May 21st in the Flex Gallery and Fred Silk Community Room Gallery. So thank you all so much. We hope you have a lovely evening.